So normally for the last, I don't even know how many years, or well, my my Sundays would, you know, this was my life. Get up, uh, get up nice and early, and head up to the footy club and start setting up for a for a day of football. It's a glamorous job of a president in a junior footy club. So this is my this is my route, and even this, you know, this was a. You can see the amount of development that's occurred on this street in the last, you know, four or five years. No question that it feels like the demographic around the club has definitely changed. It's a funny situation that we're in because we have a very rich history, a really, you know, traditional base that goes back into the 1880s from, from a Surrey Hills football club perspective, but because of, um, because of the reformation of the club in the early 90s, we're effectively only 30 years old. And, and as such, even though we're in a really established area, we're a very young club and the culture of the club is, you know, it's, it's very youthful. Um, we really have been building the senior club off the back of the, the junior football club. I mean, we're not famous for much at all. Um, I, I think we're very much, you know, we've sat in the, the bottom echelon of the lowest division of the Eastern Footy League for the last three decades. And so um, most, the majority of people aren't aware of us at all. And if they are, they know us because um, we did make some headlines. We were on a losing streak of some note. It was almost embarrassing to, to the league. 67 consecutive losses. That's a record unfortunate to have. And so this is Surrey Park Football Club. Um, this has been my home away from home for a long time now. Okay. Sure. So this is our, this is the history of our, our club and the two clubs that we're formed from. So Surrey Hills is the Royal Blue and Red, very similar to a Melbourne Demons jumper. And East Camberwell is the Navy Blue and White Hoops, um, Geelong, the same as the Geelong jumper. With the new entity that is the Surrey Park Football Club, embracing the past and representing where we are presently. So East Camberwell, 1946 in the, in the um, CYMS Football League and Surrey Hills, 1888, like back to the start of football. That's our 30 year history. That's our 130 odd year history that we want people to, to embrace again. however they feel about how things played out that, that caused those two clubs to come together to create this club. It's a shared history. We want them to come back and embrace it all. Do you think that lack of um, history that you mentioned has um, hurt the Surrey Park Football Club up until this point? A absolutely it has. local football oval in Melbourne's eastern suburbs is home to Surrey Park Football Club. Playing Eastern Football League's fourth division, the Panthers boast a proud heritage that includes the Surrey Hills and East Camberwell Football Clubs. Just give me a sort of an overview of 
the club room story about how it, how it became that you were going to you know basically get a bunch of the club people to go and build it. Uh, well, we got we all got involved to start off with. We obviously we, it was the brickworks and the demolition. We all got involved in that. So it was um, when we decided to build the rooms. It was a club decision. The club was going to do it. The club was going to do the work. Was the club in a, a good sort of state at that point? Yeah, well, we were first division club, Premier Division, um, had been for 20 years at that stage. But yeah, the club was in a good place. Oh, Surrey Hills days, all that was there was obviously the, that's still the original roof structure was there, was cantilevered over the grandstand. And so all this wall was, none of this was here. It was a concrete terrace seating up there as the old, all the old grandstands used to have. And, and at what point did you guys get involved to, to build the new, new rooms? Well, 84, basically we started uh, after the footy season, started the demolition and we constructed it during that season's uh, cricket season. We had it ready basically to go the start of 1985. Well, all the club members led by, driven by the club president at the time, Kevin Shortis, and the committee people, players, and supporters did all the work. Oh, it was great, yeah, great atmosphere on basically every Saturday and Sunday for six months. The um, players all worked here to, to construct it. Most, 90% of the work was done on the weekends. And when we dug it out, we used to call it the divorce pit because uh, no one saw their wives or girlfriends basically on the weekends for six months. Oh, I think just everyone could see what the future enjoyment we'd get out of it. There's, you know, at, probably at that time, you know, we're going back you know, 40 years ago, um, very few clubs had social rooms. Most of them just had the old change rooms. We were probably the first club to have uh, elevated with glass windows looking over the ground. Oh, I, I still feel really good about it, knowing that um, I was involved with the constructions of the rooms. Probably the only one, oh, I'm the only one involved in the club still here who was. Could you foresee at that point that in, um, you know, within about 10 years you'd be um, merged with a... With no, I don't think anyone could at that stage. At a point in time, there was a, um, a rationalisation, I guess, in this area, and part of that rationalisation led to. I, I wasn't, you know, as I say, I wasn't part of the club at that point in time, but I think effectively Surrey Hills Football Club um, ran out of money, took a break, took a year out of competition to reset and to figure out how to move forward. And at the same time, perhaps East Camberwell uh, must have faced similar challenges, and so the clubs decided to move forward as one entity. And in 1994, um, Surrey Park entered the Eastern Football or the Eastern Football League as it was at the time um, for the first time. I'm not sure what the name was going to be out of the merged clubs, but from what I've been told is there's a covenant on the actual Surrey Park that whoever plays on this ground as, a, as in a football side, Surrey has to be in their name. And I'm pretty sure that's why it was called Surrey Park. I was involved from 1978 onwards to late 80s, early 90s. Disappeared for a while, came back th three, four years ago, and obviously heavily involved ever since then. Yeah, again, how, how difficult was it to see that from a person that um, was such a, you know, a loyal follower and someone that built the club rooms? Yeah, uh, yeah disappointing. I suppose it was probably disappointing when the club fold, um, not fold, but they merged with East Camberwell. But at that time, that was the only way for the basically the two clubs to survive. And uh, I look back at it now and I think I'd rather be here involved with Surrey Park. I'd rather it happened now than the, the Surrey Hills connection gone forever.
No one wants their club to die, but no one wants their club to merge either. It's like I want my club to survive as my club is. And so the people who were attached to that royal blue and red yoke, that new entity doesn't mean anything to them. And for a lot of the ones who are in the cat strip, the same is true. A lot of the Surrey Hills people never followed the club. I know that for a fact. A lot of people did not follow the Surrey Park. They felt that um, their identity was gone. Your jumper's gone, your club song's gone, your colours are gone. A lot of them played all the way through juniors up until seniors. And the uh, thing that you've probably played for and loved for all those years is gone. Name's sort of there, but it uh, was gone. Oh, a, a lot of people would have said, let it die. Or let it go. I'm glad it didn't, but uh, I think a lot of people would have said, let it die. Never take anything for granted. That uh, could be all gone tomorrow. Could be all gone tomorrow. Oh my god, I, could, I hope I don't forget everything I've got to say. Yeah. Don't pull faces. Oh, don't, don't cry. Go out, go out. Right, so I first came, probably sort of got involved at Surrey Park when my son, about 2005 at Auskick, and it was huge. Saturday mornings were massive. Um, it's probably, you know, over the next sort of five plus years, there was up to 200 kids out there on a Saturday morning all um, running around in their AFL jumpers. Um, there was parents everywhere um, and it was huge. So Saturday mornings were massive. We moved to Melbourne in 1997. We were first home buyers and it was around here that was sort of the first home buyers belt. Surrey Hills, Montalbert were suburbs that were sort of on the, on the up. We were one of lots of families, young families buying into the area at that time. And so it was definitely a growth corridor then. There's no question that this area was gentrifying, you know, it was, it was young families, but it was also, you know, real estate values were on the rise and like fairly, fairly well healed generally in terms of the junior football club parent base. You started having um, families where, where both both um, partners were working, so that that might not have always been the case in the area. But you know, you had um, working parents. Um, you know, kids didn't necessarily go to the local high school; they went all over the place. The community was very much um, part of of the junior football club. It didn't just stop it at a football game, you know, people supported each other in this community. They helped people that, that needed help at times. So the community feel was, was pretty big. So, you know, that was important as well. When you say there was that community feel at that time only in the junior club? Yep, yep, I would say, yep. The senior club wasn't experiencing the same enthusiasm, um, growth, enjoyment. That, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't um, a time that I guess that for some that, that they even want to remember that time. My mates who had kids in the junior club, they were the ones who were commenting about, um, you know, just the, just the disconnect. It was more, you know, 
how bad a Surrey, you know, it's that, it, that was the conversation, you know, it, it, and there wasn't, uh, there wasn't necessarily thinking, you know, gee, the junior club's good and the senior club's bad. It was just, gee, we go and watch them on a Saturday and it's, it's tough to watch. It is tough to watch. Well, I think, what, what, like I said to you, I think the first time we talked about it, I think the thing that, the hardest thing really was that the junior club, as I say, if they even knew that we had a senior football club, they knew the senior football club was no good. One of the things about footy are losing streaks and winning streaks. Um, they can stretch on for a long time and it takes a lot of character to persevere. Have a look at this. While this scene may be typical of thousands across Victoria last weekend, the Panthers' recent record is anything but typical. It was bad. Let's be honest. It it was bad. You know. It, it, well, it was, I hate to say it, but it was probably it was almost embarrassing to the to the league, really. There would have been so many times where they would have been goalless in a game, set some kind of record for the least number of goals kicked across a season, or a stretch of games where they didn't manage to kick a goal. What would it have been like to sort of, you know, watch the team at that time or be a part of the club at that time? I don't think they had anyone watching. Because in all honesty, who's going to go and watch a side that gets uh, thrashed every week? They weren't not getting a win. Like they were getting annihilated pretty heavily almost every game. Uh, it, I became accustomed pretty quickly to just watching the Division Four ladder week on week, just seeing Surrey Park's percentage not get any better, and just the the losses continuing to to bank up. Yeah, it would have been a pretty grim time, <laughs> I think, for Surrey Park fans. Um, yeah, that's what I, that's my recollection. So you've been, this is your third year? Third year. Yet to see a victory? Yet to see a victory, unfortunately. I certainly remember those days. I remember being an Auskick parent and having a player come out as we were kicking the footy on the ground at, at Auskick to ask if we wanted to come and play football that day because that's how tough it was for this club to field two sides at that point in time. You know, to, just to get a resi's team on the park, they're trying to pull people in from anywhere. Oh, they're probably saying we'll joke, laughing stock, I would presume. Like the guys were turning up and pulling the jumper on without, you know, no community love, no community. There wasn't, you know, community respect for the club and the past of the club wasn't, in, you know, wasn't embracing the club. Now, if anyone in this room has sung the song after a senior win, because Surrey Park's last win was in 2008. We'd go out for a drink on a Thursday night and the footy club was a topic of conversation, you know, it was because of the, the plight it was in. You see in comedies and occasionally you see in documentaries where they make, you know, they, you see crowd shots and you see the people and they are in those unsuccessful clubs and the people are just standing there going, oh, God, they're shit house and, you know, they sack the coach and, oh, you're fucking hopeless. That sort of stuff. That's what it was like here. You know, it was a definitely a, that, yeah, as I say, a point of discussion in the community. Um, what to do, what to do was definitely, because, again, Kids were playing on a Sunday, you know, not mine at that time, but the kids were playing on a Sunday. And do we want them to, do we want a club that, you know, they can aspire to play for in the years to come, the club they can be proud of, and that we can all be proud of. The Yarra Junior League, Surrey Park side of things was very strong still at, at the time. You know, it was, was certainly putting up really competitive performances across various age groups. Wasn't, um you know, where people came here and played for Surrey Juniors and ultimately thought that was where they were going to play. You know, that, that wouldn't have been um, the first thing in a lot of people's minds. There was um, clearly a groundswell of people. You know, there's, there's 200 kids playing footy on a Sunday. 
uh, they're going to go and play elsewhere. But if we can harness them and get them into the club and feel like this is a club they want to be part of in the years to come, then then would, that'd make a difference. Why did you succeed though on the senior club did it at that point? On field? Well, you were a destinate, like both really. Well, we probably, we, we, there were the amount of families in the area, um, the good feel, I guess that, you know, they, teams won premierships and that always, um, that keeps juniors and parents coming back again the next year. What were some of the, for that period, what were some of the like greater implications? You know, we, we, was the club actually close to... Oh, like, finance, yeah, yeah, correct. Finance in trouble. If you don't win, you don't make money. Simple as that. Supporters don't come, don't put money across the bar, the canteens, players, memberships. Clubs takes a lot of money to run a football club these days. You know, like a fourth division club like ourselves, you know, you've got to turn over 250 grand just to stay afloat. It's a lot of money. Oh, well, I, you know, I mean, there was a real prospect that the senior club didn't survive. 20, 20 years in its existence, 20 years into its existence with no success, and really for a couple of years there, no prospect of success. saying the committee have quit so we had an extraordinary meeting with the EFL and uh, you know I was, I was driving to the footy club in my car and, and I was crying and I felt sick in the stomach because I thought the EFL were going to wrap us up and we were going to fold and I was angry too because everyone had abandoned us and no one cared Except one man did care. He saved this footy club from folding and, you know, we owe everything to him. Yeah, sure. What do you want me to talk about, anything? Is that enough? Yep. And, you know, at that time when I went to Surrey in 2008, um, like, you know, we, we were in a lot of debt and it would have been just as easy to say, ah, oh, well, bad luck. Another club hits a 120-year-old club, hits the dust, and who cares? Well, I care, because um, I don't want to see any club that's 100 years old. Certainly, that, I mean, that's a marvellous milestone for any club to, to achieve. And then to see it will just evaporate. Um, you know, I didn't want to see that happen. I think there was a disconnect in, in a whole lot of aspects and mainly, mainly respect from between the two groups, the seniors and the junior club. There, there wasn't a uh, convergence of, of actually ideas of being the same. They thought that we were a bunch of rabble and drunks and whatever else. And uh, I suppose the senior club, uh, a lot of players and that sort in the junior club were, you know, were toffs and whatever else. And then, and of course, it was never going to actually uh, converge until we both aligned with what we thought were, were the behaviours that we wanted in each club. <laughs> Made me laugh. I laughed out loud yeah, at this. The, the junior club thought the senior club were bogans and drunks and the senior club thought the juniors were tops. Yep. yep. So that sort of... Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. There was a cultural yeah. almost... Yeah. Dubai. Yeah. Well, well, there wasn't. There was no connectiveness, really. Well, the story, you know, like the the junior club told itself the story, or the committee did at the time, that the reason the senior club was in the position it was was, was like like the LNP and the ALP, right? The, like the, they were the ALP and they were shit financial managers, and 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 we were we were great because we had all this money in the bank, and it's like, yeah, actually, 
We have nothing to spend money on, and, and they do. We used to have separate fridges. Yeah. Well, I have, a, I have two keys. One's a two and one's a three. The two opens the storage areas for the senior club and the three opens the storage areas for the junior club. When I came on, we were literally, nothing was shared. And as I say, even, yeah, two fridges and we each had our own padlock and our own key and they couldn't get into our fridge and we couldn't get into theirs. If you look at the demographic of that area of Box Hill, and a lot of the families that were coming from there were well-educated, some people with some very um, high level roles in business and whatever else. They did a lot of great work in their junior club with the teams that they had there and had a lot of success and still do. I think it was a bit of a bridge to see uh, them embrace a senior club at that particular time. And, and, you know, and the senior club had to move quite a bit in that direction too. The junior club very well run and whatever else, but um, you know, it, it had disengaged from the senior club in most respects. From a junior club perspective, we were growing so fast. All we, all we wanted was a bit of latitude. We, we needed some flexibility. We were really stretched, but they were rigid. They were, so if like whatever agreement existed in terms of how we would share the grounds, they were not open to, there was no flex. There was a lot of pushback from me, um, but I don't, re I don't regret any of that. And I, don't, I don't make apologies for any of that. And, uh, and I'm just hoping maybe some of the things I did well and maybe some of the things I did bad had some influence on people in the junior club to say, well, I need to get in there and make this our club, and our local club. In hindsight and watching that 2011 video and thinking back, I understand where what Rod and Tupi and those guys were trying to achieve, even though they were a skeleton crew, right? And this, the fact that they were trying to bring some, some level of professionalism to a club that probably, like it had none, and in a lot of respects, it didn't deserve any, but they were working to try to create standards ahead of performance. The guys uh, themselves, they, they're, uh, they're obliged to do things in our club. They're not, they're not just here to play footy, but they're to be actually involved in our club and actually help rebuild our club because that's what we're actually doing. We're you know, rebuilding it virtually from scratch. Those people that came on board at like 09 and, and went through that losing streak, they were probably the people that were actually fixed. That was when the club was actually getting better. Uh, exactly, it, 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 was. it was. It was healing itself it was. and it was getting better and that's, that's that. You know, like I say, in 2010, I reckon it was, Andrew Tupert asked to, to talk to them. You know, they were trying to connect to the junior club and literally we sat here, we sat here. The boys were on the floor right there and Andrew Tupert had his back to the bar and he was addressing them. And as, you know, that's verbatim, one of the kids. My dad said, you guys are shit, why would I? You know, and it was like... I think it was a good and great club, even when we were in the middle of those losses, when we started to make ground with the the culture of the ones we're looking to develop. If I could wind the clock back and go back to those times, I, I would absolutely embrace that football club and want to help it. But I didn't, I didn't know that football club. I didn't have any history with that football club. I had no reason to be connected to it. They were trying to, they were trying to build the values. They were trying to create something and they didn't have it yet. And we didn't understand that because we weren't that close to it. That's why most of the best players from that club in that probably that period from, oh, I don't know, 2000 to 2010, um, went elsewhere. But unfortunately, Surrey Park Senior Club weren't getting the benefit of that at that time. It's the, it's, it's the path, that, that was the discussion. The path, why would people take a path, young kids who have turned 17, 18, 19, 20, why would they take a path to play for a team that's gonna get flogged pretty much week in and week out? So that's what we had to address, but yeah, I, I yeah, um, that was that was for me the key, yeah. As I look 
there's basically no names above that age group that I recognise. So that's pretty much the age group that stayed. And when we started to, so what are they, 2013, I think, would be their Colts year. That's effectively the group that is the start of when we put a 19s on the park and, and Surrey's juniors committed to playing football at Surrey. That, that was the bridge we, that we needed, that link between senior and junior. And, and that, that in itself caused that movement of people coming with their sons, watching them play under 18s in the senior club, then starting to sit, engage in the senior club, and then take active roles in committee and whatever else, which is what happened. You can't have a successful senior club without a successful junior club. To see the kids that are going to get opportunities over the next few years is just awesome and that's probably where the club's improved most, it's building that relationship. And you reckon that first win's not far away? Well, I'm, no, pretty close. Huh? Yeah, it's pretty close. I think if you can see today, you know, we're fairly competitive, so... And I think, you know, this year was really about from ground zero and then next year we're really going to step it up. Throughout 2012 in particular, that's when I sensed that something, it, the first win was just just around the corner. Um, they had a couple of, off the top of my head, they had a couple of really close lo close losses by maybe between two and four goals. Sometimes we got close and you think, oh, just a little bit more, could have we could have taken that game. And I remember one game at Sylvan, we were leading all day. Sylvan were a top, top, top side and they won the flag that you think. And, uh, and it was only in the last eight minutes we capitulated, you know, you know, lost number 62 or something or whatever it was. Yeah, I saw it on YouTube, against Park Orchards. There was a massive circle in the middle of the ground. And I think from what from memory, look at a lot of the blokes had sheets of paper with the club song on it, because obviously it hadn't been sung for five seasons. So weren't there, but I imagine it would be uh, quite an emotional day. And the Surrey crowd was boisterous. It was wonderful. And I thought, you know, not only are the players playing to that level that we could win this game, I, th I thought everyone thought we were going to win it. My recollection of round one 2013 is the EFL media team was at another game broadcasting, um, but we were keeping very close tabs on the game that, that, that Surrey Park were playing because we sensed that history was in the making. Pissy fourth division club that couldn't win a game for 60, 70 games, but a bunch of useless dickheads that couldn't play footy. That's how people saw us, but they, we weren't that at all. I think it was relief. I, I, that's the main, that, for, for mine, that's what I remember about the day was that he was just super relieved, Andrew, to, to, to get that win. And it was just like a, for so many people, an outpouring of, a, of emotion. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a huge day in my life and in, in the club's life. It was so important, you know, it had been, it had been a long, arduous struggle for four years um, and uh, we're all, we're all getting a bit agitated with it. I know I actually got a jump with number 67 on it and stuck it up in the rooms. The jumper, there's, there's a jumper that hangs in the Surrey Park club rooms of the uh, where the players that played in that first win have signed it. And uh, that, that hangs in the Surrey Park club room somewhere. And there's a, there's a, a debate that would say, why would you celebrate a, a, the breaking of a 67 game drought? I think there's a sensitivity in general from the group of people who were attached to the club when the club was unsuccessful. 
right? And so you saw the sensitivity from Tombs about jumper number 67, right? Which, yeah, I took it down last year. It got pulled down there because some people were affronted by the fact, oh, why are you celebrating that? I'm not celebrating that. <laughs> I'm just saying, understand it, what happened. Make sure it doesn't happen again on your watch. And, and I think that what's evident now is that in 2013, when that, that finally changed and, and virtually most of the people on the committee tend to be ex-junior people or junior people that have transitioned, um, that I think they felt they had ownership in the, in the senior club. But they also still carry that massive chip on their shoulder, which is you didn't you didn't bring us in, you didn't love us, you you cut us a you know like they want to believe that they want to you know and it's like and you don't appreciate what we did to keep the club alive and so it's nice in a way that you know we make the documentary and I think maybe we get hopefully we get to set the record straight on that. One omission one time they grab onto and go, oh yeah, you guys, you know, and it's like bullshit, of course we do. Like we wouldn't have a club if they hadn't done what they did. It's just, it, I, wasn't, I wasn't around for it. And I think that's a bit that they, they forget. Just hoping maybe some of the things I did well and maybe some of the things I did bad had some influence on people in the junior club to say, well, I need to get in there and make this our club, our local club. I think they're on board now, which is great. And, and seeing, you know, people like Rowan is president there now, and um, he was a you know, junior president for a long time. And was, I think went into that role the last year. I was junior, senior president, and he was junior. Um, so, uh, you know, it's been a long journey for everyone. I think the reality is it's a celebration of persistence. It's a celebration of resilience. And it's a, a celebration of a lot of people being prepared to do a lot of hard work for a lot of years. Um, and that's what it represents rather than the, the, the breaking of, of, a, of a losing streak. But the fact that it took them then six years to get back in, into finals meant that they, it, it took a lot, just as much time, longer time, to actually learn how to have sustained periods of winning and sustained periods of success. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think as you think about organisational dynamics, right, you, you you go from surviving to thriving, right? And so when you're not winning games, your focus entirely is on surviving. And then that's kind of a tipping point where you go, hey, we won a game and, you know, now we can start to build into the next phase. Um, you, you, you know, you're putting yourself onto the path that is doing more than just surviving. It's just a question of how quickly you can you know, reach one of the destination points on that journey. Sort of felt at the time like a marker for, you know, we were or, you know, evidence that we were on the right track. And of course, how could we know that then we wouldn't get to play a game of football in 2020 and everything would stall for a little while. So they've just developed, they got into finals, and they've just developed a, a good winning culture. And then COVID hits. Sporting codes around the country are tonight facing an uncertain future. With bosses in the end. And then that, which is obviously shocking for local footy in general, there's barely any local footy competitions going at all throughout 2020 and then there's it's extremely interrupted throughout 2021. As the momentum was building we ran into the COVID years and everything kind of stalled and starting up again at the start of 2021 was um, was pretty tough and you knew you'd lost cohorts you know you knew that the stuff that you'd done in terms of building the pathway and bringing your juniors through you kind of had suddenly had a gap again. <laughs>
girls' footy and women's footy took a hit with COVID. I know, I know sport and football did in general, but women and girls' footy in particular across the country suffered because of COVID. Girls just dropped off. The 2019 was the working group between like trying to get get it implemented for 2020 and then of course COVID hit. So they were, the team was, um, had started pre-season training, coach had been appointed. Um, it was, you know, junior players that had finished and were transitioning into this senior women's team. It was really exciting. And then COVID hit. The 21 and 22 are probably building, yep. building sort of years. Yep. And you get to 2023. Yep. Talk us through that because that's a pretty successful season for the, for the women's team really. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. It gets overshadowed a little bit. Well, I just was actually thinking that, so the senior women's team made the, the grand final as well. And I, the highlight for me um, was, I don't get emotional like wrong, but on that grand final day, the amount of um, support from the under 19s, the reserves or the development team and the senior men's team and the, and the people in the community was huge. So, they were playing a, a team that was very, very tough, but Surrey's crowd was was like. And in the oh, pack, and you can hear the fans down below us. The spirit and the support was like, it was amazing. Yeah. Oh, just a fantastic uh, couple of minutes here for Surrey Park. If I can put this one through. They worked so hard to get into that grand final and they, you know, um, just, you know, um, the excitement that they got and everybody got from it was really good, yeah. Well, they, you know, they're clearly a they're very strong side and we saw in the grand final that, um, you know, our girls, oh, I, I'm not sure they could have done a lot more on the day. I thought they actually played really well. Um, they just got beaten by a better side. It's redemption for the Wolves. The 2023 Division 2 Premiers, the East Sydney Football Club, 12 well They saw what East Ringwood experienced and, and they want the same experience. Um, and so they want to take that next step. They want to be better. And um, what we've seen from them so far suggests that they're prepared to do the work to, you know, to, to be the next in line. They're desperate to have that success. Well, I mean, if you think about the first year, we, we won one game only in 2021, one game. Second year, uh, we made finals, finished fourth, won a final. So finished third, um, and then last year finished second, won a final, finished second. So the progress, hopefully, you know, next year we got to we got to at least set ourselves the opportunity to make the make a grand final again. I think, yeah. Culturally, the club was, you know, very male dominated. You know, even as certain as not so far back as 2019, it was 20, 2019, it was a male dominated club. To finally get the women's team up for Surrey Seniors was, was really exciting. Was there any sort of pushback? Yeah, there was at times, yep. Women did not really feel comfortable coming to a Saturday senior game. You know, there were some women in this community who said football clubs are for men because that's what they grew up in. Footy clubs are traditionally blokey cultures and blokey cultures come with with a set of values that isn't necessarily inclusive and you know the necessarily the same values as what your community has and I think that's been part of the challenge. Once um, you know female football was coming it it had to change and, and the and the people here at the time wanted it to change and they were ready for that. You had to sometimes um, be prepared to to call things out and that wasn't easy, you know, especially as a female when you've got to call out behaviour or norms that were not and should not be a part of, of a football club anymore. So yeah, it wasn't easy, I'm not going to lie. Um, and you can't force these things, I think, and you know, certainly talking to my daughter, you know, these things happen by degree, so you can't force a culture change, you have to work on it and I think to see both um, 
I think you know all of our teams made the finals uh, and all my teams made grand finals this year, which was a remarkable achievement. To see the women supporting the men's finals games, see the men coming to support the women's finals games, you can't force that, that just happens because they want to. The Senior Junior Football Club worked together to um, ensure there were female friendly change rooms. You know, that hadn't been the case. So there was all, all, all of those things were really, really important, you know. Um, and they, those things then talk to that success now because, you know, um, you, ha you had to do, you had to embrace it and do it right and, and have a shifting culture. Um, you know, to ensure that that it's one football club. Yeah, the guys that were flying up to the point where, like, so we basically... Who's the guy that plays? Uh, Kobe. Kobe. Kobe, yeah. He was good. Yeah, Kobe's great. Um, his brother, his brother's a fantastic player. Um, so, you know, he's, he's basically... Um... Oh, I mean, it, it's, it's actually hard to put into words how much it means. It's, um, you know, you, you, you feel like you're doing a lot of things right. You, you think that you're building, you know, the right parts of your club out to actually get to a point where you can be successful. But the proof's always in the pudding. And nothing, you know, last year felt like in some respects a lost opportunity but it also felt like we actually weren't ready for that success the division four efnl grand final between sylvan at surrey park out here at east Bird reserve currently the reserves game taking place but he got me the ball knocked out of his grasp and the rebound goes all the way finds spiff on his own in the forward line he shrugs a tackle and from 40 meters out he celebrates the first goal of the grand final do you, do you think any of that uh, that dark day period, do you think any of that at that point, because you hadn't had the success yet, do you think that was still lingering? No, not, a, not at all. Not at all. No, we went into that game thinking we were winners. So I could be 20 points up, not 13 points up. Because well, the momentum yeah. is going to swing, isn't 100%. it? They're, they're, sorry, Park are not going to have the dominance they've had in this first half for, for yeah. all of the second half. This is where it's boiling over. Players are becoming their own sheriff and they are taking the law in their own hands. Obviously, very young group. Everyone's first grand final. I've never played in a senior grand final before. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of a whirlwind, to be honest, that week. That sort of got to us, I reckon. This could be the fire starter that the Cats need. It's all tied up until this kick. Kimpton from 15 metres out. He trots his way towards goal. He puts it through the middle. Here's Kimpton. Hands and knees. Now gets the hand pass off. Running an open goal is Kimpton from 30 metres out. Here's Kimpton. And here's another goal for Sylvan. Yeah, everyone was pretty heartbroken. Um, it was a pretty hard, hard pill to swallow, especially getting so close. It was one goal um, that last sort of minute almost had a set shot to put the scores level and they go back the other way and get two goals up. So to be that close, it was pretty heartbreaking, to be honest. Sylvan come back, tight game. They kicked the last two goals of the game and just um, utter disappointment, utter disappointment. 30 years without without even winning one, it's, uh, it's not, a, not a record too many clubs want to climb. It's, that, that's an example that a team really does truly learn, need to learn how to win. Opportunity, Sylvan running an open goal. Here's a big one. Goal square. Once gets a big goal. And it's Sylvan's premiership for 2022.
you know, we rolled out of the AGM at the end of 2021 without a president. Um, and I started having a discussion with the committee sort of late 2021 and it was early 2022 that, um, you know, I was still in the role with a junior club and I was like, it, I, you know, I'm at the end of the runway with the junior club and so I guess I'm open to the conversation knowing that someone has to do the role and I feel like it's good for the club to have someone who both has a connection to the junior club. Like for all the right reasons, it was like, yeah, okay, even though I get that it's going to be a personal commitment, um, that I'm not sure how I'm going to manage it, but I'm, I'm open to it because someone has to do it. When you're in club land, you know, like there's times where you guys just got to roll the sleeves up and, and do something because like, like someone has to. I'm not a, um, like I don't like to just jump in and, like I'm not, it's not my in my nature or my style to jump in and try and start overriding people or making decisions. I, I, I needed some time to kind of observe and, and understand um, and learn about the senior football club because it wasn't my club, the junior football club, you know, was what I know of Surrey Park. So when we got to the start of 2022, um, I didn't really have a good understanding of the landscape of where the senior club was at with its playing ranks. Um, I knew obviously that we, we felt like we, we were building something. So at the start of 22, it, it was really only a couple of weeks out from the start of the season that we realised we weren't gonna get an under 19s side on the park. We knew we had really good, we, we had some really good talent from our nine teams that had played in that 2021 season that didn't reach its fruition, right? And so for me, I knew those, I knew more, I knew those kids, the guys in the nine teams more than I knew the senior playing group at that stage. And I was really concerned about what would happen if we didn't field a nine teams, would we be able to keep those players? Because as I say, we'd already lost engagement with a couple of cohorts through the COVID years. We couldn't afford to lose those 19s players, but we already knew that some of them were committing to play football elsewhere. And so it was like, I didn't know, I didn't know much about football ops, but I knew that if we didn't make them feel like they belonged here and make them feel special and put a contract in front of them and say, we want you playing footy at Surrey Park. It fell to our players, and I think that's where you realise, you really start to realise the value of having had a strong junior program that is still quite well connected, that guys within the senior football club were able to reach out to guys who'd played football, junior football here, who went, yeah, sure, and pulled boots on and pulled a jumper on, and you know, some of them hadn't played for three, four, five years. How important was it that you went down that path and you didn't let them go and so you're just trying to sign players from other clubs and throw some money at it. If, if you know that you can keep players at your club and that playing in this jumper means something to them, then I think you do everything that you can. There's Lockie Summers, who's return, returning to the club. There's Kane Hendon, who's returning to the club. And there's Riley Tempany, Hamish Burrell and Deck Hauser, who were all playing at the club in 2022, Hamish went away to play in the VAFA this year at Skebs. I think he's coming back in 2024. Um, but Riley did his knee in the prelim. Deck played in our dev squad. And as you go across the board, that's effectively the age group where the junior club transition coming through to the senior club started. And so you've got Lockie Summers, who's coming back with Jake Summers, his older brother who was at BNF in our Colts side. Um, and then as you look across these age groups, you start to find a lot of names of guys who have been playing senior football here for the last few years and other names that are guys who, you know, we, we hope that we see them back here again. It's almost, it's almost like a sense of tribalism almost to, to bring, to get the game back together, but to get them back to achieve something pretty special. That's clearly, I think, what's happened in... Um, in the past few years, uh, I think it's a great strategy um, because there's a sense, I think, for any player that goes on to bigger and better things, they always remember where they come from. Um, no matter 
how big they get, how good a player they are. Um, they always, I think, have a sense of gratitude towards the club that helped develop them. And I think that's clearly a case of what's happened at Surrey Park. I don't know, maybe over time we never, from this club's perspective, we couldn't sell people on that idea. But we could see what we had. We could see that we were we had this young core in our senior club and that it was only going to get better if those 19s boys became part of it. Welcome to East Ringwood Reserve on another fantastic afternoon of EFNL Grand Final Football. And today it's Division 4 style and it's Surrey Park taking on Kilsyth in what is going to be an absolute rip snorter of a grand final. There isn't too much between these two sides and uh, I look forward to... Uh... For a long time, I suppose, the, the belief that existed here was that, you know, until we could until we could um, get some bigger bodies on the park, we were always going to be, um, you know, we were always going to be susceptible to the physical brand of footy that you get in a senior, you know, Div 4 senior men's. Um, and the young players wouldn't stand up um, under that pressure. And I think that was a pretty, pretty widely held belief that, you know, you're sort of, there's a, there's an idea that there's this model that is to get out of Div 4, you've got to buy your way out. And that means you've got to go out and buy the big, strong bodies that can compete with, the, you know, a lot of sides do have those big body players. Yeah, Kilsoft for me, I think Kilsoft has been a very dominant team all year. Probably the best team in the home and away season. Kilsoft for me. I'm, I'm tipping Kilsoft and I think this will be close, so I'm going to go eight points. I, I think this will be one that we won't know who's going to win until the last quarter. I'm going to go Kilsyth as well. I'm going to say 18 points. I think it's going to be cagey, but I think those bigger bodies around the ball are going to get the job done. And Surrey Park, we all know their trials and tribulations, 60, setting a record, 67 consecutive losses. That's a record unfortunate to have, but if they can get a premiership in 2023, I think in terms of maturity of a football club, this is going to be very exciting. 2023 Division 4 Grand Final off the back of the square, O'Neill comes flying through. Surrey Park under a heap of pressure, no penalty for dropping the ball in the tackle. The ball crib bounces out, here's an open goal, O'Neill starts the game, bowling for Killside. Again, Arthur up against Tiggins, no clear winner. McNay did really well, shrugged off two tacklers, got the handball away. Ivanovic did really well also, got the kick inside 50, he's got a man on D. Well, as you're speaking, Curry just pulls it out of the ruck, pulls around on his left, and he signals to the crowd, and that's number two for Kilsyth. He was lively in that forward half, he comes in, the shot drifting to the left, doesn't have the legs, it's coming back! The first three goals of the Division 4 Grand Final to Kilsyth. Quarter time in the men's, you're down three goals? Yep. I want to say? Yep. Um, what are you what are you thinking personally? Um look I felt okay. Um I didn't feel like the scoreboard was re was reflective of the game that I was watching. How do you see it? Look, we just we're not mixing positions well enough. I suppose we're just kind of playing to the magnets. We've just got to move the footy around by moving the positions around as well. If you look back at the vision, we had a lot of scoring shots in that first quarter that we just didn't capitalise. So um, in hindsight, yes, um, you probably look and go, yeah, that's a little bit nerve wracking. Just nerves uh, coming out a little bit. Hillside kicked the first goal in the second quarter as well on that. I sort of went, oh. It bounced off. O'Neill from the tackle. It's on the goal post. Is it a goal? The goal up by signals. Number four for Kilsyth. Four goals, three, 27. They lead by those four goals over Surrey Park. Not kick a goal in the first quarter. Four goals down. My, my sense was that we were... We weren't rattled by that. You could see that the players were still focused on the game and the game plan. Surrey Park have got their first and now they're on the board. 1-4-10, trailing Kilside 4-3-27. Paolini's first gets Surrey Park's first in the second term. Defence sets up nicely, but Kilside get it to Wycard. He's trying to get it open for a shot. He's hand pass to Henshaw. Henshaw's under a lot of pressure. O'Neill finally snaps it from 40 as he gets the hand pass. Release hits the post. It was a long goal at it and it hit the post or the players yeah, the, did. The players it might the be post. a goal. 
It's a goal in the end, but the players who tried to defend it knocked it and wobbled the goalpost. Leo Neal from 40 snaps a brilliant one. Oh, uh, that's the third goal now. He's kicking the first half, and that really hurts Surrey Park because they've controlled this quarter. So uh, that is quite unfortunate. Isn't it? And there goes the halftime siren. So Surrey made their way into that contest in the before the half, but they still half time break before, but they still trail 2921 to kill side 5-3-33 after a 30 minute quarter came in at half time and um yeah just had a refocused um the group everyone knew we we're, were all on the same page that we weren't playing to our absolute best um and yeah we we're making a few mistakes here and there but we knew deep down really young group that we can um really come out in the second half and put on a show I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that halftime address of the of the grand final. Um, to be inside that Surrey Park room would have been pretty special, I think. So uh, clearly, whatever said was worked. He's on the run, so he'll be kicking from 50. Will Smith. It's an 11 point margin. Smith loads up from 50. It's long. It's brilliant. What a goal by Smith. And at a half past the two, he decides to run around on the mountain mark, takes a bounce from 45. Long ball to the top of the goal square. Paolini! Forward close to the boundary line. Steadies his nerve, gets it to Smith. He'll go again from 40, running to 35. It's all the way. It's a goal. We have a tied up game in grand final. 11 minutes, third quarter. Free traffic. And Paolini might just get the fifth goal in a row. It's now Surrey Park leading by 18 after the third goal to the big man Paolini. Watching the game, I guess it reached a point where you sort of had to suspend your belief. Halfway through the third quarter, when we hit the front, when it felt like we had the run on, you just knew because we'd been there a year earlier we were effectively in the same place against Sylvan in 2022. And the question was, had we learned what we needed to learn from that 2022 experience? And we all thought we had. And I was confident that we had. To see a club like Surrey Park, who've not won a premiership, to have a huddle that was 10 deep, and to actually hear them in the effects mic cheering. They are excited. Let's hope that excitement gets channeled professionally in this last quarter and Killsife will throw everything at them. When, when you've lived through a period of no success, you know, when you know what the history of the club is, it's really hard to believe. It's really Surrey Park of Premiers, the first senior premiership for the club. This would bring a tear to the eye of any neutral. This is the pinnacle of a lot of hard work from some diehards at Surrey Park. Uh, looking around me, seeing all of the guys, the, the guys who played so much footy at this club, the, the blokes you know who were out on the park, who lived through those terrible years turning up in their football jumpers and seeing the emotion on their faces here yeah, and then the girl. I think, um, so I reckon the, the first win in 2013 would have been about relief. I reckon the grand final win in 2023 would have been pure satisfaction. Everyone's got a second club, and I think there's a heck of a lot of people now in, in all divisions keep a look out and see how Surrey Park are going each Saturday. The day they won that first game, the club never went backwards. 